Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, pleased to see everyone again this afternoon. Um, my name is Chang Nguyen from um, Climate Work Center and the Monash University, and I'm your host this afternoon. Um, for those who didn't know about ASEAN Green Future yet, um, just very quick summary um, of who we are. Um, this is a multi-year program involving um, the UNSDSN, Climate Work Center, and nine country teams. Um, and we work together um, with leading university and think tanks in South Asia, um, except for Brunei, to undertake the net zero uh, pathway to inform policy recommendation in South Asia. Um, this morning session, um, in the morning session, we already discussed, um, started with the state of decarbonization um, in South Asia, the regional collaboration, then followed by the presentation on decarbonizing power sectors um, in Laos and in Malaysia, and then uh, followed by a presentation on net zero emission in power sector in Asia. For this afternoon session, we will hear from another um, three countries uh, who also participate in the ASEAN Green Future Project, um, the Philippines, Singapore, um, and Vietnam. And um, as an economist by background, I'm very excited and very honored to have um, three distinguished panelists who join me today from uh, three leading economic institutions um, in Philippines, in Singapore, and in Vietnam. Um, I would like to um, quickly introduce um, all them three and uh, please um, stand up so that people can see you uh, before later on you present um, your presentation. Uh, first of all, Dr. Joy Abrenica from um, the Professor and Deans of the School of Economics, University of Philippines. Dr. Chu Wen He, um, Assistant Professor, the School of Social Science and Economics, Nanyang Te Technology University in Singapore. <laughs> Dr. Watson Ving, Professor and Dean, Institute of Business Research, University of Economics, Ho Chi Minh City um, in Vietnam. So the afternoon session will be from 2.30 to 4.15 sharp. And Professor Leong did remind me several times that I need to finish strictly at this time. So um, if I do look at my phone sometime, it's not just because I'm, it's not because I'm checking email or message. I just try to <laughs> keep the time right. Um, so without um, going further, talking too much, um, I would like to start with the first presentation from uh, Dr. Joy Abrenica. Um, and a little bit of introduction about Dr. Joy. Dr. Joy Abrenica is the Dean of University of uh, the Philippine School of Economics. Um, she teach industrial organization and international trade course and her research interests are in the field of in competition policy, industrial organization, international trade and technology. Please, um, the floor is yours, Dr. Joy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a very preliminary work with my colleagues from the University of the Philippines. Their names are all listed there. Okay, okay so I'll start with the, a bit of a context, and uh, that would explain why this is the results that I'd like to discuss today. So first, about a little bit about the Philippines and um, why it's in why we are focusing on, on certain issues. Uh, then I will look at the Philippine Energy Plan, which basically did the same modeling that we're doing now for the project. And I would then discuss our preliminary results, uh, the model that we have uh, been working on as a team, the simulation scenarios and the results and the things that we need to do uh, further so let me start with the Philippines. What, what makes the Philippines a bit uh, different from other ASEAN countries is that we have a power sector that is basically market-led. And so we have uh, the generation and the distribution and transmission all privatized. The implication of that is that the decisions 
uh, that would have to be made in order to uh, move forward with any net zero plan uh, would depend largely on the private sector. The second thing to remember about the Philippines is that we have the second highest price of electricity in the region. And this has been a problem that has plagued us for quite some time. Uh, we're only second to Japan uh, in terms of power rate. So this is a big matter or big consideration when discussing any plan for uh, decarbonization. We have, uh, not surprisingly, no commitment to have net zero, partly because a lot of the things, a lot of the decisions would have to be made by the private sector in the end, and the government would just be there to provide the incentives and direction. Uh, what is the story about the Philippines? Pretty much the same as in uh, the other countries that you've heard this morning. Okay, so the greenhouse gas emission, okay, um, we have made the commitment to reduce 75% uh, of the GHG, reference to the BAU scenario, which is from 2020 to 2030, if you don't do anything, the estimated greenhouse gas emission would be about 3,340.3 uh, million tons of CO2 equivalent. And so the country's commitment is to reduce that by 75%, which is really big. Okay. And uh, I, I, I noted this morning from the uh, presentation of Trang, that our commitment is exactly the same as that of Myanmar. And I was telling my colleagues, I don't know who copied whom, <laughs> but <laughs> well, it's exactly the same. So what does it say? 75%, which is really, an, you, you need an aggressive plan to reduce it by 75%. But the commitment said that only 2.71% of that is unconditional. And so if we don't receive funding support from other countries, <laughs> then we're okay if we are able to reduce it by 2.71%. So it seems like an empty commitment. Uh, so if we are to uh, base that, uh, if we are to follow the commitment, we need to be able to decouple the GDP from our CO2 emissions because we, of course, would like to grow as a country. So as a country, the main source of GHG is power generation, just like in other countries. And the main contributor to that is coal. So there you go. You could easily determine what kind of policy intervention needs to be done. It has to be directed on the power sector and on the use of coal. The context, therefore, is this. We need to ha define a decarbonization pathway that will win the Philippines away from fossil-based fuels, that, that is number one, achieve the commitment that we have made, although it's a bit um, empty because only 2.71% is unconditional. But anyway, if we take the 75% reduction seriously, okay, uh, the pathway should be able to do that. And decouple GDP, energy supply, and GHG emission. So the government has been thinking about that. Okay, how do you move away from fossil-based uh, fossil fuels, uh, but at the same time ensuring the sustainability and availability of energy? And they have identified the following priority measures. Now, if you go over the list, immediately you'd say it's a confused list because on one hand, the government says we don't want any more coal plants. So there is a coal moratorium. On the other hand, okay, it says, we would like to invest on exploration of 
oil and gas reserves. So okay, it's, it's kind of confused if you read the whole plan. Uh, but uh, that's the reason I gave the context a while ago. Government is very conscious about the criticism that if you go for you know, a, a plan that would, uh, that would uh, uh, remove us or reduce the dependency on coal, you have to make sure that such a plan will not raise electricity prices. And you have to make sure that there would be enough supply of energy moving forward. So the Philippine Energy Plan, which has been just recently updated, looked at two scenarios, which they call the reference scenario and the clean energy scenario. So in each scenario, there are targets with respect to RE, okay, uh, LNG importation, use of biofuels, and electric vehicles. I won't go over each of this. So as, as, as would be expected, the clean energy scenario is more ambitious than the reference scenario. Okay, what does that plan produces in the end. Uh, it's, it's a plan that was um, also run or vetted using LEAP. Of course, we didn't see the actual LEAP model, but only the results. And these are the results that, were, that are available from, publicly, uh, from public documents. Okay, so uh, the brown line is the reference scenario. Uh, this is the GHG uh, emission from 2020 to 2040. And uh, the red line is for the CES. Because CES is more ambitious, as would, as would have been expected, it would be able to reduce GHG emission. But in the end, if we compare uh, what the plan against the commitment of the country, NDC commitment, the reference scenario will reduce uh, GHG emission by about half, no? uh, less than 75%, but definitely more than 2.71%. The same is true with the CES, uh, the clean energy scenario. Now, then you have the question of, okay, does it remove the country? Do these plans uh, win the country away from traditional fossil-based fuel sources. I looked at, we looked at the share in total primary energy supply of oil, coal, NG, and RE. And interestingly, what we found is this. Even if the scenario has a built-in target on, for RE, you would see that over time, the share of RE in the energy supply is declining. And the share of NG is increasing, but the share of coal is declining. So, okay, if you look at that profile, it doesn't look very good. Okay, so while you are, while we are able to reduce coal uh, emissions from coal, uh, well, also uh, use of coal. Okay, the uh, use of uh, RES as as targeted uh, has not been achieved. Or as, yeah. Now, this is the next question is Does the plan decouple GDP and emission growth rates? And what we see here, it, obviously, it doesn't. Okay? So uh, the red line, the one on top, is the GDP, uh, projected GDP. The one on the bottom is the projected population growth rate, and in the middle is the GHG uh, under a reference scenario. So while uh, GHG emission would be growing less than GDP, which seems to be a good news, but still you see that as GDP grows, GHG emission is also growing. So we're not really decoupling the two, uh, the two variables. And the same is the story with the clean energy scenario. And again, here you find that uh, GDP is growing faster than GHG, which you could also 
consider as as an achievement in itself. But again, as GDP grows, GHG emission also grows. We well, want that uh, to, those two variables to move in different direction. GDP growing while your GHG emission is declining. So we try to define our own pathways. I mean that the UP team, um, my team from the UP uh, University of the Philippines, uh, tries to project, na, uh, def define a pathway that could uh, do three things, the, the three criteria that I mentioned. The first one is move us away from fossil-based fuels. The second, the second is for us to achieve our commitment um, uh, with respect to NDC, uh, reduction of NDC contribution. And the third is to decouple GDP and GHG emission. So we made assumptions, some of which are common to the other members in the, in the region. So the GDP pro projection is based on the shared socioeconomic pathway scenario two. I'd like to say something about that because that differentiates our work from the Department of Energy. Uh, the Department of Energy's uh, updated plan, okay, uh, made a projection of GDP based on the fact that we had COVID years where growth was really down. While this uh, SSP, uh, SSP scenario does not take into account uh, COVID. So it's like there was uh, a COVID did not happen at all. Uh, we made certain assumptions on uh, the different sectors, but uh, I don't have time to go over each one. So let me focus on uh, the electricity generation. Um, okay, the, certain, the assumptions for household, uh, agriculture, industry, and services are all listed here, as well as the transport sector, but I'd like to focus on the electricity generation. So as I mentioned, okay, the one important policy that stands out in the list that I showed a while ago is the no coal, uh, no more new, new coal plants uh, in the coming years, except that um, some plants, when the policy was announced, had already acquired uh, PSA. Uh, this is the uh, service agreement with the, with the distributors. And so they were exempted. So they would be built in the coming years. Uh, the, the existing policies pathway is very much like the reference scenario of the DOE with some modification. For example, in, in transport, we assume a 10% EV penetration rather than 5% as in the DOE plan. In this scenario, coal is not retired. Uh, this is because, you know, Power plants, they're supposed to have 50 years life, but they actually get rehabilitated. And so in most scenario, in most plants, uh, they're assumed not to, be, not to be retired at all. So no coal retirement, and we would allow LNG plants as new baseload plants. The high ambition pathway now uh, has a higher target of uh, RE from 35% uh, in the existing policies to 50% under uh, high ambition. And that uh, in the high ambition also, we are allowing all plants that are in the Department of Energy's uh, so-called indicative list to be put up. So we're assuming that those plants would actually be put up. Okay, now in addition to existing and high ambition plan, okay, we, also explored uh, two, a variant, uh, two variants of the high uh, ambition plan. One, okay, one envisions uh, the commissioning coal plants when they have reached 50 years old. And the other, which we call HAP2, okay, uh, the commissioning uh, earlier than 50 years, but uh, at when they reach 40 years. So now I'd like to evaluate the pathways that we have explored against the three criteria that I mentioned. First, 
Okay, uh, well, this is, by the way, the comparison of our pathway with that of the uh, DOE. Uh, clearly, the, our pathway, um, the plan that we have uh, so far uh, envisioned, reduces uh, greenhouse gas em greenhouse gas emissions more than more than the PEP. Okay, but uh, let me let me show. Oh, this is the direction. Okay, this is the these are the greenhouse gas um, projected greenhouse gas emission under the existing plan high ambition and the two variants, uh, two variants of the high ambition plan. Okay, so first question, have we, are we moving away from traditional uh, sources uh, because of the plan that we have envisioned, uh, that we have uh, modeled? Okay, the answer is no. Okay, again, here you see that while we have raised the RE targets and uh, actually put RE uh, in the priority dispatch, uh, also in priority investments, you see that the share of, R, uh, of RE in total primary energy supply is declining uh, over years, even under a decommissioning on er early coal retirement plan. And like, uh, as expected, the share of coal is declining, but the share of NG natural gas is increasing, and we have not really reduced uh, the share of uh, oil. Uh, in fact, we have, uh, as you could see here, become more dependent on oil. Okay. And that's true for the existing policies and high ambition plan. Okay. Are we achieving NDC targets with these new pathways? Again, the answer is no. Uh, at least if you use 75% as, as criteria. We're only able to reduce the GHG um, 50, more than, by more than 50%, okay, roughly about 55%, much more than the DOE plan, but still we're not able to reach that 75% target. Have we decoupled GDP and emissions? And again, the answer here for the two pathways is no. But uh, the good news is that GHG emission grows lower than uh, GDP. Okay, and That's true for the high ambition pathway as well as existing policies. So given all that, given our initial results, what do we do? Obviously, we have not found the pathway that will achieve the three results that we want. Okay, Move us away from fossil-based fuel, Okay, uh, meet the NDC target, okay, and decouple GDP and emissions. What do we do next? We have to explore technologies. We were very conservative in uh, including technologies in our pathways. We have only used those that are currently being discussed or where we find commitments to build those plans. So we have not even considered nuclear, because this is a very uh, touchy issue in the Philippines for a number of reasons. Okay. We have also to look at, and this is very important, the constraints on the transmission, should we consider other types of technologies? And that's where we would need not only uh, economists uh, to do the the, the, pla the planning, but also engineers. So we have an engineer in our team. Okay. Uh, we have not explored model shifts in transportation. Transportation is the next highest emitter of uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, we have uh, yet to raise the efficiency and conservation goals set by the government. It's only 5% until 2040. Imagine that. So we need to raise it but we can only raise it to up to a level that is realistic. Okay. Finally, we would have to evaluate the impact of whatever pathway we come up with on electricity prices, because if we need to get social acceptance to this plan, it has to be a plan that will that is sustainable, energy, envir uh, environment friendly, but at the same time, it should not raise the electricity prices or uh, ideally it should even lower electricity prices. 
That's all. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor um, Joy Abrenica. Uh, I'm sure we will have a lot of um, questions for her later on. Um, but um, before that, I would like to introduce um, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Chuo Yu He, um, will present us decarbon uh, about decarbonizing the power sector in Singapore. Um, Dr. Chu Yu He is an assistant professor in economics at Nanyang Technology. Technological University NTU in Singapore and the Assistant Honorary Secretary of the Economic Society in Singapore. His research interests lie in the intersection of finance and macroeconomics with a focus on topics in households finance, sustainable finance, monetary economics, behavioral macroeconomics. Um, and his research has been published in various uh, reputation, uh, reputational journals. Um, and pre prior to his current appointment, Dr. Chu was a visiting top economics and finance, um, sorry, uh, a postdoctoral uh, scholar at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Um, and he's concurrently a member of the um, ACCA Association Charter Certified Accountant uh, and a, a CFA charter holder as well. Um, I would like to invite you on stage, uh, Dr. Chu, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Yao Hui. Okay, this is a joint work with um, Yusteng Kwa, um, Chao Wai Man, Zach Lee, and Tan Jin Rei. We're in the audience as well. So if you have any tough questions, uh, please look for them. Don't ask me. No. <laughs> so on behalf of uh, NTU Economics Division and the EGC, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us to join this project. It's our privilege and our honor to, and to contribute to this project, and we're very excited about this as well. So in this presentation, what we're going to do is to talk about Singapore's goals and plans first. Thereafter, I will zoom into different scenarios in the power sector that's based on our work in the AGF today. First, we'd like to qualify that this is highly preliminary. Sorry, it's very excited. Okay, very preliminary because it's only based on the power sector. So for more complete work, we will require to do a lot more and to give a more comprehensive overview of these other sectors at work. All right, for a start, let's just establish our objectives. So in November 2022, what's going to happen is that Singapore's revised NDC strives to reduce emissions to around 60 metric tons carbon dioxide equivalent in 2030 after picking emissions earlier. Now, so prior to this change, the goal was to achieve 33 metric tons carbon dioxide equivalent in 2050. But now, the goal is to reach net zero in year 2050. So this is an ambitious goal. It's no mean feat. So how do we achieve this? So we must first have a plan, okay? And this is Singapore's green plan. Now, so the Singapore's green plan requires a multi-sectoral approach. And it's too much to you know. I can actually go on for one lecture, in fact, talking about this green plan, okay? But first, let me just highlight some key pillars of what we are doing. So evidently, it's very broad. So we have a city in nature, number one, whereby we hope to plant more trees, increase our solar power generation, encourage industries to shift towards lower engineer, uh, energy manufacturing, and also develop clean fuel, shipping fuels. So as most of us are probably aware, Singapore is a small city. Okay, So we have a city in nature. So all these things will be... Uh, or key strategic trust for us to keep it going. So moreover, we hope to focus on uh, energy reset. So we're gonna have green finance, deploy floating solar PVs, and so forth. Now, from the demand side, how do we incentivize households to change their behavior? So one way is to import green electricity, but we're also gonna do something even more. We're gonna ban diesel cars and taxis from 2025. In particular, we're going to phase out all the ICE, the Internal Combustion Energy Vehicles by 2040, and develop green bond markets. So essentially, the roads, the, the cars on the roads were now primarily um, be hybrid vehicles or electric vehicles after 2040. And it's on top of the stringent traffic um, so-called um, uh, policies that government implemented. Green economy, we are going to have uh, open new parks, develop liquid natural gas. Now, 
And also, we're going to have a resilient future by having a carbon tax, developing carbon services, and we also want to reduce mandates to reduce waste. And nowadays, when we go to supermarkets in Singapore, they're going to charge you now for the use of plastic bags. And based on anecdotal evidence, it's proven to be quite effective. My dad and mom now go to the supermarket with re recyclable bags in that sense. So I was quite heartened to see that. Now, for an economist, all these policies could prove to be very challenging to model. So there's so many things going on at the same time. So what can we do? So, we, so, so as economists, we always say, ceteris paribus. Okay? So all things constant, in this presentation, we're going to focus only on one thing, which is power sector decarbonization, in that sense. So to identify the impact of carbon sector is not easy. So again, I'd like to qualify that these very preliminary findings that we have. And this is particularly so for Singapore. Now, Singapore has limited land and renewable energy. Unlike other countries uh, with uh, the opportunity to tap on renewable energy, Singapore does not have such um, opportunities to tap on. At this point in time, 95% okay, of Singapore's electricity is generated from natural gas. So to transit to a new carbon light economy, or carbon zero economy. We are heavily reliant on the development of new technologies and also international collaboration. So we need to work together. But at the same time, Singapore is heavily dependent on trade and we would like to preserve our competitors in that sense. So this vigorous of the global energy markets is also something we must be very wary of. So to explore different scenarios or different situations, okay, this, um, there are several possible ways. So let me highlight three possible cases presented by the Energy uh, Market Authority here. So one way is to achieve a diversified supply mix. So the, the one in green. So it's possible that one day Singapore has, let's say, uh, hydrogen, you know, imports, others, geothermal, solar. That's diversified. Secondly, we can just be heavily relied on imports in 2050. Okay? So we know there's a lot of opportunities for regional grid a clean regional grid they can tap on. Or we can also have a, a situation that is dominated by low carbon hydrogen in 2050. So each of these have different consequences. And each of these will address different challenges that we face exactly. So I will regard this as having an energy trilemma. So what's a trilemma means? So dilemma means two, trilemma means three. Now, so the trilemma here refers to affordability, security, and sustainability. So as highlighted here, um, we are completely reliant on the import of oil and gas for energy needs. And we need to price our energy correctly to make sure that we use it prudently. So while we have taken steps to have a cleaner fuel mix, more can be done. And how can we actually model them? We're going to focus on four switches. So the four switches we're going to use primarily okay, will be as follows. As follows. Okay, now. Now, so as follows, what we have is solar, first of, first of it, regional power grids, and low carbon alternative, and natural gas. So, as part of our homework for this uh, AG um, uh, 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 F program, okay, what we want to do is we are going to come up paint two scenarios. So, based on what we have uh, learned throughout for the past few months, uh, what we hope to map out is two scenarios. The first scenario is what we call the mitigation scenario, which is our work that's been done to date, it's, it's so-called proposed by Singapore's government. And a high ambition pathway is like our wish list, or what can be done even more. Let's push ourselves to the frontier and ask ourselves, what can we do? So we're going to have two scenarios, and we're going to discuss them in detail for the next um, 10 minutes or so. OK, so it's going to be a bit technical, but I'll just run through some key points. So the four supply switches, as I highlighted earlier, solar, regional power grids, low carbon alternative, and natural gas. These, again, are assumptions they were making. These, these again, are actually things that we, we are being, uh, so called um, proposed by the government. So in a, a benchmark scenario, which we call a mitigation scenario, we are going to increase our solar energy de deployment by fivefold. So the idea is to increase by at least two um, global warming potential by 2030. But let's push ourselves a bit more. If we can actually do it by fivefold, why don't we do it to, to 8.6? In that sense. So in the sense we have what we have is we have the 
high ambition pathway, allowing us to actually um, do a lot more in the sense. For regional power grids, we can have 100 uh, megawatts of hydroelectric power. So currently, we're already importing from Laos. Okay? So we can do a lot more as well. Now, in terms of the low carbon alternatives, at this point in time, this carbon capture and storage um, has been implemented, but it's quite limited because it needs space, it needs so called, um, it's costly as well. So, this is what we have um, mapped out so far in terms of this amount of carbon capture. So, hydrogen, um, uh, waste to energy, and so forth. Okay? So, this is the, the benchmark ideas that we have based on our switches. Okay? So, in comparison, we thought, why don't we do some green ammonia, geothermal, nuclear, even? Okay, for this so-called high ambition pathway. And let's compare them side to side to see if we go to our, our plan and we push ourselves a bit more for the high ambition, what can we do? Okay, so this is what we're going to go through. And of course, as economists, we need to set things constant for demand side in a sense. So we're going to set the demand assumptions based on what we are currently doing in both cases. First of all, we're going to have smart LED lightings, we're going to enhance minimum energy performance, Carbon tax are being implemented. Okay, so these are policies that we so called um, set in place already. So in Singapore right now, with five dollars um, carbon tax, we're going to increase progressively to twenty five dollars uh, per ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. Okay, in two thousand four, two thousand five. So as highlighted earlier, we are going to electrify our bus fleet. We are going to have no new diesel cars and taxi registrations. So all these things you see in our previous big picture of a Singapore green plan. We try to map them nicely into the demand channel for this particular so-called uh, presentation. So again, to qualify again, there's a lot of things going on. There's too much levers going on. So we need settings constant. So we're going to focus on this primary so-called demand channel to see what we can do. And we're going to ask ourselves, can we do even more or not? That's what we're trying to push ourselves. Okay. So in what follows for the next five slides or so, I'm going to just show you a lot of graphs. Okay? Now, so the graphs is always going to have two, two so-called graphs. The left panel is called a mitigation scenario, and the right panel is called a high ambition pathway. So, so to make sure we are so doing a fair comparison, okay, Saturus Parables, right, between the two situations, we first look at the energy consumption by sector. Okay? So it looks fairly similar in both cases, so this will allay concerns that our results are driven by the demand channel. So in both situations, it's fairly constant. The graph are the same. That's, that's fine. OK. Now, let's now zoom in on what we are more keen to find out more for this discussion. So first, we have the electricity generation by source. So let's just turn our eyes to the one in red. Okay? So the one in red is the share of nature gas. So at this point in time, there's a small work called historical and a scenario in 2022. So basically, the left side of each graph, the red section is overwhelming red. In summary, it means that Singapore is focusing a lot of natural, natural gas. So over time, based on the policies implementations, okay, you realize that the share of natural gas is poised to decrease. In other words, we are reducing the dependence of our natural gas. So over time, you see that the natural gas dependency will reduce across time, and the imports will play a bigger role. Now, so, however, in the high ambitions pathway, you realize that the share imports is increasing, and at the same time, imported electricity could even overtake natural gas as a dominant source in 2047. So if you would want to totally eradicate the use of so-called um, natural gas, in a way, the high ambition pathway could be something to look forward to. But having said that, in the mitigation scenario, you'll see that importers are already playing a very important role already. So as far as you're concerned, you can see that the importance of regional cooperation and the importance of these so-called imports is pivotal in both situations. So while natural gas remains the dominant fuel throughout the years, okay, there could also be used, increasing use waste, waste to energy, hydrogen, and solar PV as well. So this is what we are going forward towards, okay, and this can be seen nicely based on our projections, based on uh, the software that all of us are using for this particular project. So we find it consistent and robust okay, to what we are believing and what we can see in terms of these predictions accordingly. And we'll be uh, happy to discuss more even to see how can we actually utilize better usage of all our resources even more. Okay. 
Now, next. So this is just a snapshot, okay, in case you cannot see, okay, fully here, a snapshot in a pie chart. So in 2060. So 2060, most of us, maybe for most of us, will we still be around? Okay, now. But our, our, our new, next generation will definitely still be around. So this was what would they, would they face. So basically, uh, you realize that imported electricity still plays a, plays a very important role, okay? And Singapore can expect to have a more diversified renewable portfolio, which consists of hydrogen and solar PV. Now, so hydrogen and solar PV, in a sense, so you can see the technology actually drives the entire process, as well as this regional cooperation. Okay, next. So next, I'm going to talk about the share of installed generation capacity by technology. Now, so in this context, what we can see is that we are cognizant of this so-called capacity we, that we have. So in a mitigation scenario, you can realize, you realize that we're going to increase this generation capacity and stabilize at uh, 19,288 megawatts, okay? So basically, the idea is that it does not mean that we, if we just rely on so-called um, so natural gas or rely on so-called uh, other so-called products, our economy cannot grow. Wow, five, thank you so much. Five minutes left, thank you. Now, so it does not mean that our economy cannot grow. In fact, we can even grow even more to a certain extent. So from what we see and what we project, if we use this mitigation scenario and high ambition pathway, we realize that our capacity can increase even more. And this is something that we sh should be very concerned of. Sorry, we should be very, we should be very happy of, for example. Yeah, and, and there are concerns that this will not take place. So for this absolute emissions in power sector by fuel, so prior to 2022, you can see the small line there, the small little word called historical and scenario, okay? You'll see that we'll expect these emissions to decrease. So our greenhouse gas emissions expect to increase, okay? And subsequently decrease with this high ambition pathway decreasing at a faster rate. So basically, if we push ourselves even more, we can expect to enjoy the fruits of this so-called um, uh, foreign emissions if we push ourselves to this high ambition pathway. Similarly, from this in emissions intensity from all sectors. Now, so for this uh, emission intensity, it's talking about the pollution created per unit of GDP. So basically, a fall in emission intensity will suggest that less pollution is being created per unit of GDP. So in both cases, we are heartened to see that in both simulations, so-called, this will goes down. But of course, this is a high emission pathway will decrease at a faster rate, but we are quite um, happy to see that um, this intensity will fall. All right, and this is the absolute emissions from all sectors. Okay, so I think I'm out of time. So what I'm going to conclude is as follows. So based on the past few months that our, our team has worked on in this um, project, we are happy to see that the highly ambitious power sector policies modeled and shared earlier has shown some promise in reducing absolute GH greenhouse gas emissions from the power generation sector. However, we acknowledge the challenges that we face. The trilemma is one that keeps us going because we cannot be overly dependent on one particular energy source. At the same time, we cannot so-called um, be overly uh, uh, so-called avoid this so-called cost involved as well. So this means that the future technology could be a, a game chamber, changer in a sense. So for example, the cost of green fuel production like hydrogen, okay, which are very expensive now, which we don't really ext consider extensively for this analysis, could play a very important role. So hydrogen, for example, carbon capture is there, but now they're going to liquefy the carbon capture in a sense. So Singapore is not enough space, for example, and we do have uh, and uh, so petrol chemical industry is quite huge in Singapore too. So how do you transit to a so-called particulate sector? That's a very important channel for us too. And finally, I'd like to say that um, while we're only focusing on the so-called supply channel in terms of this carbon generation through the power plant, we will need to focus a lot more on the demand channel too. Because ultimately, the, how, the, how economic agents behave matters as highlighted by the previous speaker, as well as the sessions in the, uh, in the earlier day, you know, human beings are all responsible for price changes, in a sense. For example, there's already SAF available now, sustainable aviation fuel available. But most of us, when we travel from our home countries right now, so how much are we willing to pay extra to have the SAF fuel, in a sense? So it's the, it's the action that matters. So even though technology is available already, how we behave and respond okay, to these economic agents this will actually um, play a very important role in the modeling. 
So with that, I think I'll conclude my presentation. And thank you very much for having us. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, Dr. Chua. Um, and next uh, is the presentation from Vietnam about the decarbonizing the power sector in Vietnam from Professor Võ Xuân Vinh. Um, Professor Võ is the Dean of the Institute of Business Research, University of Economics, Ho Chi Minh City. And uh, Professor Võ served different um, academic roles. He is a member of the Scientific Committee in Economics for the Vietnam uh, NAFO State, which is the National Foundation for Science and Technology Development. He is also an editorial board member for several international rep reputable uh, scientific journals. Um, he used to be a teaching staff at the University of Western uh, Sydney and the University of New South Wales, Australia. And he currently serves at the board of directors for the Asian Finance Association and the Asian Law and Economic Association. Um, may I invite you to the stage, please, Professor? Thank you very much, uh, Trang, for the, uh, the introduction. Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's an honor for me today to uh, speak about Vietnam power decarbonization in the ASEAN workshop on uh, sustainable development. Um, I'm here to um, <coughs> uh, represent the work of uh, a team at uh, UEH University. Uh, we have uh, our Vice President, uh, Dr. Ding Kong Kai, here today, and uh, Associate Professor Tan Dang Khoa, and the uh, team at uh, UEH and other university in Vietnam. Um, Since that we are that recently uh, joined uh, at the ATN and in the process of organizing uh, uh, at the ATN Vietnam uh, through the through the um, <coughs> help of the uh, Professor Wing Wu and uh, Professor Yuan Wu today uh, for the establishing at the end in Vietnam. And uh, we are lucky that recently, uh, in about two months, so um, our talk today will uh, not be much on the LEAF um, modeling, but I would like to take the opportunity to uh, give a bit insight on the uh, current uh, situation in uh, Vietnam uh, power sector and uh, what challenge that uh, Vietnam uh, power sector and the strategy to overcome in, in order to achieve the net zero uh, carbonization uh, by 2015 at uh, Vietnam agree and committed at the COP26 in 2021. Um, Vietnam also served an interesting case study for uh, power sector decarbonization in, in order to achieve the net zero by uh, uh, carbonization by 2050. Um, the uh, carbon uh, power sector have to decarbonize um, significantly in order to achieve uh, that goal. Um, <coughs> carbon emission uh, severely impact Vietnam. The uh, World Bank had ranked it at an, one of the five countries uh, most likely to be affected by clim climate change at rising sea level and extreme heat put the area along it uh, 2,000 uh, 3,200 uh, km, uh, kilometer beautiful uh, coast at risk. Already uh, we are seeing the impact on uh, Vietnam economy accord according to the uh, World Bank initial calculation, uh, cli climate change related cost stream Vietnam GDP by 3.2 percent uh, GDP in uh, 2020. And uh, when projecting to 2050, um, it predicts a reduction of 12 percent to 14.5 percent uh, of its G GDP, which is a significant amount. Largely, this increase has come from the uh, country escalating uh, dependent on coal. Uh, currently, coal makes up about half of the Vietnam energy portfolio, which is, uh, which is very, very uh, significant. Uh, with hydropower, 
uh, comprising around 30 percent, um, followed by natural gas, um, 14 percent, and non-hydropower renewable, 5 percent. Overall, Vietnam used a huge amount of coal in, uh, in 2021, an increase from uh, 38 uh, boys, uh, percent, million ton in uh, 2015. Uh, but Vietnam uh, relying on coal is uh, a supply and demand problem resulting from its significant economic growth and the increase in uh, the uh, consumption necessary to fuel and maintain that growth. Uh, Vietnam reached a five or point when Vietnam embarks on, especially when Vietnam embarks on the, uh, the significant um, and uh, fabulous that uh, enter into market uh, oriented uh, economic reform in uh, 1986. The result was significant. Uh, in 1985, Vietnam GDP is on around 15 uh, billion. By 2021, it increased to about 400 billion US dollar. So that the, the, the uh, increase in the energy and the increase in uh, coal consumption in order to produce that, uh, to maintain and fuel economic growth, which is um, understandable. Uh, recently, Vietnam had emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic with uh, continued strong economic growth and notable investment in its manufacturing sector. As a result, Vietnam Ministry uh, of industry and trade uh, estimated that the, in, uh, the energy demand would increase annu annually by 8% in tandem with the expected economic growth until 2030. So that uh, the energy consumption and uh, <coughs> is going in parallel with the economic growth. Over the past two decades, uh, reform and change related, related to power market deregulation had become a com common place in the, over the world. And Vietnam also um, <coughs> um, significantly Im improved the energy market and uh, significantly restructuring the electricity market. Um, in a world of um, current uncertain situation, uh, generated a major change such as zero uh, COVID policy in China, political uh, conflict in Europe, inflation accelerated in most countries in the world, and uh, monetary tightening in some countries. Uh, and these countries are uh, partner, trading partner of Vietnam and uh, the impact on global supply chain had directly impacted the, the Vietnam uh, power generation and uh, Vietnam uh, energy consumption. Uh, recently, <coughs> Vietnam also uh, imports from uh, electricity from uh, Laos and China, but uh, we also had agreement to export electricity to uh, Singapore starting from uh, 2030. That is uh, another challenging for Vietnam in order to, uh, to reduce that, uh, uh, to re reduce carbon in, um, to make to the commitment in 2050 by the Vietnam uh, government. Further, in order to um, <coughs> reduce that, not only uh, Vietnam can do the <coughs> can uh, do the <coughs> can 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 help to improve um, the energy market in order to reduce that a lot of issues that we have to do. First, we have to ramping up the solar and wind power penetration. We have to reform the electricity market, and uh, it attract foreign investment. Uh, in order to attract uh, foreign investment in zero uh, carbon uh, energy sources, uh, Vietnamese government have to do a lot of things to undertake uh, serious and uh, significant reform. This is because uh, 
uh, Vietnam currently reliant too much on uh, coal. At, at uh, I mentioned previously, 50% uh, of the uh, Vietnam energy sector is on uh, portfolio is coal. Um, um, the EU, a trading partner of um, Vietnam, uh, plan to imp implement the world first uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism from uh, October 2023. Uh, during the transition period, the scheme will require importer, which Vietnam is a major importer to, uh, to EU, uh, to report embedded carbon uh, in the imported good. From uh, 2026, Additional taxes will be levied on imported goods to uh, bridge the gap between the EU carbon price and the price in exporting country. So uh, in uh, Vietnam, economy is relying on export. So this is another challenge, and also this is the stimulus for Vietnam to uh, to to, to uh, uh, restructure its energy sector to what. The word uh, more power sector decarbonization. Um, the preparation uh, for the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism is therefore important and significant for Vietnam. Uh, and in order to achieve that and to extend, expand its export to fully reap the potential benefit of the trade agreement with. Um, EU, Vietnam will need to uh, mitigate the uh, adverse impact through this scheme. This can uh, only be achieved by uh, reducing emission intensity of Vietnam export product. So as I'm talking uh, here today, uh, Ho Chi Minh City is the first, uh, uh, it's just uh, launching the first scheme in Vietnam in uh, order to apply the tariff for carbon tariff, carbon tax, and carbon pricing uh, in a trial, in a five water launching in Ho Chi Minh City, the first in, uh, among the first in Vietnam, uh, city in Vietnam attempt to, uh, to uh, <coughs> uh, apply that scheme in order to reduce carbon. And uh, uh, hopefully this will help to mitigate the, the risk and uh, improve or prepare Vietnam more further ready as an exporting partner for EU. Um, at the uh, sector uh, that uh, uh, Vietnam uh, sector that um, um, producing goods and services uh, for the exporting to, uh, to EU, uh, consume a very large amount of electricity, uh, decarbonizing the electric, electricity sector will significantly contribute to the emission reduction in uh, this sector. Uh, fortunately, Vietnam had uh, massive potential to harness the solar and wind energy uh, to faci uh, facilitate uh, electricity decarbonization. Uh, estimated uh, by the um, uh, EVN Vietnam, the combined potential of solar, solar and wind power is about 46, about 50 times higher than the country installed capacity by now. So actually, that the, the, the potential for solar uh, and renewable other renewable energy is about 50% higher than the, uh, the current capacity, which is a good, uh, good news and uh, a good thing for uh, Vietnam. Therefore, uh, in, the, in the near future, Vietnam could focus on uh, ramping up, increase, increasing solar and green uh, power penetration. Um, and other other thing that uh, I would I don't I do not like to uh, work uh, to talk into detail because uh, it is more on technical side, uh, focusing on the uh, upgrading the grid current grid system uh, in uh, Vietnam is also another another way another strategy to uh, 
to uh, remove the um, to improve the current situation and um, to uh, um, ramp up or to 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 increase the uptake for the uh, solar and wind output due to the current issue in the uh, limited uh, grid capacity. Uh, this will be an area that we uh, we will look into the. Um, into the into that issue in the very near future uh, when uh, we have enough data as I mentioned that uh, because we joined that uh, the project uh, very recently that we we do not have uh, we are still in the process of uh, collecting data for the for the uh, uh, modeling so um, that my talk that uh, that that focusing a bit on the the current issue and the current uh, um, uh, situation for the Vietnam power sector, and also, but uh, luckily that uh, we have uh, we have potential. It uh, indicated that like uh, to to um, to sum up that it an, uh, a key takeaway that it is estimated that uh, renewable energy that we can it uh, fifty about fifty times the current. Uh, the current install capacity at the moment. That is uh, the key thing that uh, we 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 uh, think and we are confident that um, we can we can keep and make the uh, commitment by uh, COP26 that by 2050 that um, Vietnam will keep that uh, to maintain the zero carbon in the um, country and also. Uh, <coughs> Another good thing is that, like uh, Vietnam, you know, even though that, that uh, the current uh, portfolio of en energy uh, sector in Vietnam is around 50% uh, reliant on uh, coal, but um, you see, we can see that the the, the, the increasing from 30% to uh, significantly increase is expected to be increased in the other uh, other type of energy sources um, and it's expected that Vietnam can uh, can make it and uh, uh, <coughs> and more important th thing is like um, Vietnam have a good will from the from the top down from the government to the uh, country uh, to the to different um, organization and uh, university level um, like uh, in Vietnam, the, the Vietnam have national power development master plan uh, currently, and the national strategy on uh, climate change, which will, with the uh, ambitious aim to um, to reduce the, that uh, uh, the carbon uh, emission by to the zero percent, and uh, um, <coughs> that to. Um, that that uh, that change and that uh, willing need to change it happen everywhere. Even like at UH uh, University, uh, at university level, we are also uh, aiming the word uh, on becoming a sustainable university. And uh, you know, sustainable development is one of uh, our imp university important strategy. That uh, and, and recent uh, uh, recognition that we are ranked at around 300 uh, plus. Uh, in uh, the the system ranking, so together uh, I think that we can uh, we can do it. And, uh, and I mentioned that um, first of all, I, I would like to take the opportunity to thank that at the end for allow allowing EVH to uh, become um, uh, you know, like uh, at the end and hold uh, at the end in Vietnam. And uh, we expect that in the near future we can uh, we can. Uh, Continue, uh, continue more uh, toward a sustainable uh, development um, globally. And thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Vo. Um, you mentioned um, um, something around sustainable university. I just want to use well, one minute of. Um, advertisement about our one of our flagship product as well together with SDSN, Climate Work Center, Monash University and SDSN um, 
co-author uh, a guideline called Net Zero University, which um, show how university worldwide all together can contribute to the global jet net zero um, emission and uh, net zero efforts. So if you are interested, you can Google Net Zero University guideline by UNSDSN and Climate Work and Monash University um, to uh, for reference. Um, and um, I would like to invite all the panelists to um, go on stage and then we can um, start the Q&A session, please. Thank you. All right, um, I think I'll take, um, maybe I'll open to the audience for Q&A. Um, maybe I'll take um, two questions one at a time. Um, anyone have any questions for our panelists? Please raise your hand. Yes, please. And uh, before you uh, ask the question, would you mind introducing yourself as well? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Lal Chan. I can say as a member of the Institute of Engineers Malaysia and fellow of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. It was very interesting to hear your presentations following on from this morning. I have a few questions or comments. In the Philippines, do you consider your geothermals as renewable or clean energy, because geothermal is technically depleting energy. So do you consider that as part of your renewable energy share? OK. Uh, I also think that you are probably too modest in saying that unconditional savings will be as low as 2.71%, because unconditional energy saving can be very effective and significant in many ways. For example, star rating of consumer appliances, energy efficient chillers, air conditioning, installation of cool buildings and so on. And I think Singapore is a very good example of that for cool buildings as well as net zero energy buildings. Now, in Malaysia, we have had a lot of activities on this saving energy, safe programs, where the government promote five star and recently even four-star air conditioners, refrigerators with grants. That's relatively cheap and easy to re implement as well as to get buy-in from the public. And when the public realize the savings they can make, it is likely to go much, much more. Uh, the other thing that I have where maybe I'm a bit biased is consideration of hydrogen for power generation. Now, Using hydrogen, if it comes from fossil fuels for power generation, is actually a brainless idea because then it is still fossil fuels. But if you want to take hydrogen, green hydrogen, from using surplus renewable energy, which countries have surplus renewable energy? Even UK, Germany, Denmark have surplus renewable energy only for a few hours a day on low demand days like weekends and public holidays. And not many other countries can claim to have enough surplus energy to generate hydrogen. And the round trip efficiency of generating hydrogen from electrolysis and then using it to regenerate electricity is only about 30%, which is a criminal waste of energy. At a recent uh, seminar between the University of Technology Petronas Malaysia and APEC, that was held at the end of May. It was the paving the way towards hydrogen for the future. And the international speakers confirmed the situation that green hydrogen is too expensive to be used for power generation if you're going on this kind of round trip cycle. And it is not likely to be economically viable before about 2030. Now, of course, Malaysia, Sarawak has done its promotion for a green hydrogen hub. But talk of CCU to get blue hydrogen. Carbon capture and storage sequestration is very expensive and not viable. CCUS is viable in niche applications, for example, the oil and gas, oil and gas or chemical industries. And what is more important is that at this seminar, it was indicated that I think in 1920, 2021, out of about 90 million tons, of hydrogen produced, less than 10% was used for the power usage, whereas over 90% was for other uses, like fertilizers, chemical industries, uh, 
and sim and uh, uh, refining of ores. So I think uh, the current apparent uh, hype of using hydrogen for power generation or green hydrogen for power generation is really a not very wise uh, option, even though politicians seem to be going for it in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your valuable comments. Uh, I think on the point on geothermal and unconditional target, um, Professor Abaranika, would you like to respond to that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the comments. I'd just like to say that uh, the reason we were not, we didn't consider hydrogen, we didn't consider CCUS, we didn't consider all those seemingly uh, technologies that would actually do the mitigation that we want to achieve is because uh, we want a, a plan that our leaders could buy in and the public could buy in. And so we know that we will get into this all sort of debate uh, whether it is cost viable to go into these technologies and and in the end nobody will will mind the plan <laughs> that we come up with and that is why uh, th that is why we have results that uh, mitigate or reduce emission not as much as the, as we have committed as a country because we only considered technologies that uh, currently we have some indication from the private sector that they would like to invest in or are thinking of investing in. Those are the only technologies that we considered. Having said that, technologies change, sir, and I, we <laughs> so we're looking at 2060 and not 2030. Uh, so. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, if we are to consider those technologies, it would have to be somewhere down the road, I mean, 2040, 2050, when these technologies are ripe enough for, for the market. But at this point, we have not considered them. In the next iteration, maybe we could do that. Thank you for the, your comments. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I also add up an, an experience from uh, Vietnam where uh, that uh, hydropower is uh, comprising around thirty percent of the of the energy uh, sources, uh, energy portfolio. But um, the reliance on uh, on this hydropower will also cause uh, some significant problem, a uh, re relocation of the people and the fluctuation in the output. It's also another another issue. But luckily in Vietnam, as I mentioned in my speech, that we have the ability to uh, to enter the uh, renewable energy, wind and solar, with the estimated capacity can, can be around 50% of the, the current uh, capacity. Thank you, Professor Vo. Um, Dr. Chua Yuhi, um, I think if I'm correct, um, Singapore also have a hydrogen strategy, right? Or, or, or do you, would you like to have any comment about hydrogen as a technology in Singapore? I think at this point in time, we're still exploring. So I don't have uh, much to say at this point in time. Yeah, for this. But we're definitely shifting away towards uh, away, away from natural gas. So we are importing, we're finding, we're diversifying so called our so called um, um, energy imports. And hydrogen is one of them yeah. that we could possibly exploit in the future. But uh, right now, we are using you no know, solar PVs, we are importing. So we're trying to diversify because, as I mentioned earlier, Singapore is a trilemma in terms of trying to sustain our own energy needs and so forth. Yeah. So Thank you. Yeah. Um, so before opening the um, another question, I I'm just really want to unblock a little bit, um, Dr. Joy, because um, this is very interesting. I, I would like to discover more, Dr. Joy, um, because from my understanding, most of the Southeast Asian countries um, the transition are quite state-led, whereas um, I think Philippines is the only one, and it has been uh, highlighted several times in your speech and your Q&A that it's a private-led. Um, yeah. But then from the experience around the world, the state plays a very important role in terms of providing um, like investment in science, innovation, in technology, and setting up the policy certainties so that private sector can 
invest in. So how would private sector in Philippines would be able to sort of be confident to invest without a sort of long-term certain uh, policy for renewable? Um, I'm just very interested to understand more uh, about that. Well, actually, okay. they say that there are lots of projects in the Philippines that are worth investing into. Uh, but uh, So there goes the question, why? Why aren't we getting the investment unlike <laughs> Vietnam? <laughs> and the answer is, uh, I think, very complicated. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, uncertainty, policy, policy uncertainty, or even um, actions, uh, certain actions of the government. But nonetheless, uh, see, the problem if you have uh, coal plants that are owned by the private sector, and you want to retire them so that you know you have cleaner air. <laughs> so how do you do that? Okay, uh, if it were owned by the government, then it, yes, the government could just decide to shut it down. But if it were owned by the private sector, then they have to be compensated. So the next question is, where do you get the money to compensate them? And hence this idea that uh, that um, private sector is. Uh, floating around that we should be getting assistance from multilateral agencies or raising funds uh, from donors who understand the value of the environment, etc. But it's not, not that easy. I mean, uh, the decision of uh, coming up with cleaner fuel uh, would have, uh, if, even for example, uh, sorry for taking, answering too long, even for example this, uh, no coal, uh, no coal, uh, no new coal uh, policy. The coal moratorium. Now it's it's a very debatable ish a policy, or it's a policy that went to several debates, uh, and in the end, the government has to give in to the fact that some uh, potential investors have already acquired uh, PSAs, and and so they could not. They have to exempt them. <laughs> so that's the problem. If it were the government building the power plants, then uh, yeah, the decision not to build new coal uh, plants would be easier. Yeah, but uh, this is not to say that I'd rather go back to a situation where all our power plants were owned by the government because we had a terrible power crisis in the 1990s. It's all because of government inefficiency. So I'd rather have it in the hands of the private sector still. But again, the decision's not going to be easy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Choi. Um, can I open the floor to another question, please? Anyone um, have another question? Please raise your hand. Okay, my name is Yuan Yong. Uh, Professor Joy, I didn't quite catch why uh, the RE ratio uh, kept going down, even though you said the marriage order for RE uh, is high up there. That's question number one. Question number two is that I see that uh, you put um, decommissioning coal power plants that are 40 years old, 50 years old as scenarios. I'm curious, uh, under... Um, in under usual circumstances, what do the what does the Philippines do with coal power plants that's forty to fifty years old? Do they keep running? Yeah. Please, please go yeah. ahead. The the power plants are just rehabilitated, so you don't see um, you don't see that considered in the plan of the government either in the existing policy reference scenario or clean energy scenario. The, the, it is not assumed that those plans will uh, will suddenly be decommissioned if they get old. Uh, uh, yes, they are rehabilitated because it's privately owned. Uh, so, in fact, the plants that were formerly owned by the government and and then privatized were rehabilitated, and so that extended the life of the. Uh, now, about the question on why is it that RE share is going down, okay. Uh, even if it is in the in the current model, it's still not an optimization model that we have. Uh, we're still a, need to learn the optimization part of LEAP, but uh, but we have placed the 
solar and other renewables uh, on priority dispatch. So high on the merit order, high on the endogenous capacity investments. And that's because we suspect that uh, the variability of RE, okay, uh, you need uh, plants uh, to take, uh, you need plants to take, uh, um, to fill up that, uh, that variability to compensate for that variability. And as a result, the LNG, uh, the natural gas share is increasing. Oh, so that fills up the, that fills up the void that uh, caused by the variability in RE. Thank you. Um, please, the lady behind there as well. Hello, my name is Christina. And um, this is with regards to the Philippines again. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, just, um, I know you said the, the plants are owned by the private sector. Um, but I was, just, uh, I was just thinking whether there were also listed entities, public listed entities. Because if, if, if they are, is there some sort of guidelines or some kind of policies that the um, either you know the the um, the equivalent of the uh, our bursa here, which is um, uh, listing requirements, would require uh, uh, um, listing requirements or um, guidelines, you know, for listed companies, uh, sort of you know uh, ensures that or make make companies ensure that they do follow certain um, ESG kind of uh, policies and guidelines or they adopt and implement? Are there, is, are, are there something like that? Are, are these companies public listed? Okay, um, I think you are referring to um, distribution companies who would have to source their power uh, from RE. There's, a, there's that policy, a certain percentage of, uh, of, of the electricity uh, distributed. That, that, that policy is imposed on the distributor to, uh, to source their power from RE plants. Uh, yes, there is that policy, but, uh, but you know, it, it, it is monitored and it is, um, but it's not enough. Uh, to uh, encourage, well, um, well, it's not enough at this point. Yeah. To add on to this private public discussion, for example, in case of Singapore, right? Even though the government set guidelines, you know, but the public, the private sector actually still owns a large proportion of these power generating plants. In fact, I, um, this YTL Power International is uh, is headquartered in Malaysia. They actually own the largest amount of generating capacity in Singapore, in fact. And also the big, uh, also we have this so-called um, Japanese um, consortium firms, you know, like own this Sunoco Energy Private Limited. So I don't think that this dichotomy between the public versus private. So if this, so as long as you know private sectors uh, are efficient enough to, and also in line with the government objectives, they can have a win-win situation in that sense. So I think it's, it works in a sense. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's a very interesting issue in Vietnam it's different where the uh, electricity market is dominated by the state even though it have some uh, yeah it can ha uh, don't have problem with the investment and all that thing but it will have problem with the pricing the electricity efficiently that is um, that, that that like we we recently experienced the uh, electricity shortage in uh, in Vietnam, which is um, causing a lot of issue uh, at the moment, why the Vietnam economic growth is fueled by the, 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 the energy sector. Uh, that's the two sides of the story. <laughs> yeah. And can, can, can I follow up on that yep. as well? So um, so the, the Vietnam electricity EVN um, also has quite a lot of, as oh. I read it, um, finance issue related financial situation as well uh, when it comes to their um, debt and um, also how they get invested. Would you like to comment around that as well? All right, that, yeah. uh, thank you. That interesting issue, but uh, from the, you know, from the an economic point of view, let that on that I think that the, that the financial issue of the, the source um, and uh, electricity, electricity player in the Vietnam market, I think that, that 
the pricing problem, like where they have a lot of investment everywhere, and um, that investment uh, is um, the price of the electricity is normally um, formulated by cost. But when the, 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 the firm, the, the only firm, they invest not only in electricity thing, but also like they in the hotel, in the real estate, in the banking sectors, and if they lot it there, and they cannot increase in the you know, price of the electricity, uh, electricity because it's regulated by the, the government, that caused the issue, I think. Thank you. Um, maybe I open the floor to another question. Anyone has any further question? Yes, please. Um, the uh, good afternoon. My name is Shekhar. This question is addressed to any or all of the panelists. Um, and it's a question that uh, touches on the topic of benefit versus cost of some of the renewable energy sources like <coughs> wind um, and solar, for example, and there are others which are, I guess, emerging as well. There appears to be a view, you know, that some of the projections around benefit versus cost of some of these technologies are over-optimistic, that the cost of actual um, manufacture and creation of these sources of energy and the, the quantity or the capacity uh, of these energy sources that would be required to match those of conventional energy are quite substantial. And the current projections on the efficiency or the benefit versus the cost could sometimes be a little bit over-optimistic and therefore painting an over-optimistic picture of how um, beneficial or to what extent these energies can replace conventional coal and oil and gas and so on. So I was interested to understand what's your view or what's your take on that perception that I think is, is quite a, um, you know, a wide perception amongst various commentators out there you know, in the marketplace. Acknowledging the fact that some of these energy sources will increase in efficiency over time, no doubt, but based on what we have today and the various projections that have been made, how does that correspond you know, to your understanding of the benefit versus cost? Thank you. Thank you. That's a very interesting question, and I guess the answer might also vary quite different from different places because um, depending on the context and the level of development of the economy, that might impact on the benefit and the cost of um, at balance as well. So maybe I, I start from my right-hand side first, and then we... Um, continue with other speakers. Um, um, Dr. Chua, would you like to comment? Yeah, th thank you very much for the question. It's a very important question, definitely. Talk about cost-benefit analysis for this renewable energy. So from our, our perspective, especially as a price taker in Singapore, because we import more of our raw materials in a sense, so we get to shop around, correct? So, we, so in terms of the most efficient kind of resources available, I think competition plays an important role here. Because if it's monopolized, for example, by one particular sector, for example, yes, they could be inefficient and so forth, but if there's more opportunities available to the region, in a sense, if there's more places you know, giving us this, um, the, the private sector will be very incentivized to actually utilize these this so-called available resources that we have so far. So with more competition, with more opportunities being given, so we believe that this inefficiency will be driven down, in a sense, and we can actually tap on these opportunities and with more competition, I, be, I think this could actually be a lane in the long run, in a sense, in short. It's actually um, often raised in forum where you where, uh, you have w on one side saying that, okay, you, you are selling the idea of renewables, but you are not considering the impact of uh, that on electricity prices, especially in the Philippines, as which I mentioned, has a very high price of electricity. But then again, uh, as <laughs> as uh, maybe as economists, or <laughs> bad way of saying it. But anyway, as as a citizen, okay, uh, as a person who who would who would not 
just um, a private citizen who is not just looking at the financial, the immediate return to, uh, to the investor. I would be also looking at the other benefits and the other costs that are um, not financial or not immediately realizable. And so in the end, maybe those uh, would balance out. And currently, you need the government to say, indeed, if you consider the social cost, et cetera, the externalities, et cetera, uh, then uh, renewable would be a viable, uh, viable option and uh, something that worth investing into. But uh, it's not an easy sell because uh, if you live in a country where electricity prices are high, uh, it's kind of difficult to sell that to the public. But it, yeah. I tend to agree with uh, <laughs> the, the speaker that um, yeah, in the in the very near future, that the, the price of and the investment will be efficient in uh, solar and wind uh, energy sector. I believe, even though it's at the moment there's some difficulty in that uh, because it had to compete with the traditional energy source like um, coal, and it, it we have um, the. the Information from to this morning session that co like coal is still there to in the, in the very near future something like that, that due to the the cost issue, but I think that in the very near future that will that will be you know like the the uh, with the development of technology that wind and solar energy will be you know, one of the alternative very soon. If, if I may just add. Part of my question related, when I say cost, part of my question related to cost in terms of cost of natural resources, cost of raw materials, to actually manufacture the machinery that produces this type of electricity, solar panels, you know, wind turbines and so on. So the question was, was meant to also address that part of the equation when I talked about cost versus benefit. Uh, and that's 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 a subject that's not often talked about. We talk about the need of mining precious metals and so on that are required to produce the machinery that actually generate renewable uh, energy. So I was hoping you could touch on that a little bit as well. So you mean the cost of the technology itself or the cost of to deploy the technology is both? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, because as I read it, uh, the cost for the technology itself for renewable actually reduced significantly in the last couple of years and in some countries it's it's quite actually um very cheap um but the cost to deploy the technologies um in some countries that it's especially if it compares between developed and developing countries, there is significant gaps between those costs because sometimes there is things like added up by perceived risks of investing in Im emerging markets or the un uncertainties of policies, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, so I, I guess there, there are two types of, of cost when it comes, and yeah, you mean both. Would you like to comment any of you? Yeah, sure. So let me add on one, one component, let's say fixed cost, for example, to talk about this cost story. So for example, as I shared in my slides earlier, Singapore wished to have um, a, a vehicle fleet without any um, ice, without internal combustion. What we're going to experience is that we're going to have EVs. So imagine in the EVs, electric vehicles were, what do we need? We need chargers, correct? We need to charge. So it's off sunk cost, for example, which we do not see. So we need two things right now, this is what I see. For example, we need scale, because if you have a lot of EVs everywhere, the cost goes down in terms of number two is all fixed costs. If you have charges everywhere, for example, this would release the cost involved for these sectors. So if a lot of these are all fixed costs or sunk costs in that sense, as an economist, we think marginally, marginal thinking. So the additional cost would not be that significant in that sense, no way. So what we need now is a big push. That's what we're here for, okay? To push everything forward, to push it such that you, know, you, you allow this so-called huge cost, be it mental, be it physical, be it charger, for example, to so-called move into a new cycle, to a new optimal solution, okay? So we're going to move to a new equilibrium such that the cost now will be now be lowered even than before because if you think from an electric vehicle charging point of view. So 
it's very hard to imagine a city, in fact, Singapore hopes to be one, okay? We, to be one with that is less reliant on this fossil fuels for our vehicles on the road. So personally, I do not drive an EV yet, but some of my colleagues are shifting towards. In fact, below my office, if you come to NTU, we have an EV charger right next to our office, in fact. Okay? So it's hinting to us, it's time perhaps, see, to change to an EV charging machine over here. So ultimately, we think the mindset change, and if you think of margin thinking, once the fixed cost is being sunk in, um, we can move and transit to a new equilibrium, in that sense. Yeah. Thank you for highlighting uh, the it, what you are talking about is carbon accounting. Because here we want to reduce carbon, hence we rightly should track the carbon cost of things, right from the mines to the cars that we are driving. And you are right that this is something that um, is not done um, uh, frequently enough, and some, it is something that we should work on. And we hope to be able to give that picture uh, to, um, to solutions, pro uh, to, to, to solutions uh, in the near future. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the cost of renewable energy, I think the cost of solar photovoltaic LCOE is cheaper even than coal when it was $85 per tonne. So now it is even much more cheap. And about 17 years ago, when I was with the MBIPV team, we evaluated that the emission recovery cost or emission cover cost for photovoltaics was about two and a half years. That means whatever emissions goes into its production are recovered within two and a half years of its operation. Now, that figure is probably less than two years. Uh, in terms of uh, wind energy, Vietnam is lucky to have wind, but along the tropical zone, there is really no wind. And, and if I may follow on this, EVs. I wonder if anybody can convince me why are countries going for EVs when hybrids have a higher emission reduction factor than EVs when your electricity is predominantly from fossil fuels. For example, in Peninsular Malaysia, about 90% of electricity comes from gas and coal. So your EV is not going to reduce emissions except marginally. But if you have a hybrid which has a much more efficient utilization, the emission reduction is much faster. So we should go for hybrids, the mild hybrids, have fast emission reductions. So by the time those hybrids have passed their age 10, 12, or 15 years, EVs will be more attractive and electricity will be more from renewable energy rather than fossil fuels. I can't get anybody to convince me that this question of emission reductions and EVs makes any sense except for political and economic perspectives in terms of the industry development. Thank you. Any of you would like to comment about EV as a solution? Okay, I'll comment briefly on EV, okay, since I brought it up. So now, so basically, for the assumption, because right now the assumption right now is that we're still relying on so-called fossil fuels, general electricity. But so now, what we're going to do is we're going to plan hand in hand together to convert into renewable energy and use EV at the same time. So I do not think we, could, we should treat electricity as a separate issue. So we're going to do them simultaneously to transit. Moreover, it's not easy to transit to EV because, as I mentioned earlier, we have this fixed cost, sunk cost, mindset shift. Personally, I'm not shifting yet. So, so what's going to happen is that we're going to shift towards 10 years or 20 years' time. As exactly what you pointed out, in 10, 20 years' time, we're going to have a win-win situation where most of us have EVs and so-called renewable energy. So we're going to transit towards a new equilibrium whereby we're going to have so-called um, renewable energy to generate our power plants. That's what we are targeting towards, and I think we will achieve it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. My we only have five minutes left. May I take the last question from there? And then um, I have to conclude this strictly at 4.15. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. So I, it seems that we have a dilemma. The problem is uh, whether we want to commit to the environment, to the earth, or we want to commit to economic money. Uh, so at some point, we need to decide which one is more important. We want to, it's like in, during COVID time, we can come up together with a solution, come up with a vaccine that, will, that is possible. 
uh, is situation is similar. We want to survive or, or not. We want to survive, maybe we, we have to sacrifice the economic, the business aspect. We come together and uh, come up with a survival solution. Uh, even though it, would be, it, it may be a bit more expensive, we have to pay more. But if together, I think we will make it cheap, cheaper. It's just like we come up with the COVID vaccine, something that, like that. Do you think that is possible? To find a, a collectively, find a viable solution, uh, not, not just for business, or financial gain, but for the, for, the earth, for the sustainability to avoid uh, further damage to the environment. Thank you. So Thank you. Uh, you mean that we shouldn't act as business as usual anymore and we should treat it as a crisis and everyone should act upon it rather than trying to think about it as, as nothing happens at the moment. Thank you. Um, I think would any of you would you like to comment on that? Yeah. <laughs> what? I got it. I think that um, it's very uh, interesting issue that uh, what we should uh, act and what we should go from here. And um, yeah, and, uh, I, uh, from the first part, I, I tend to agree with you that we have uh, to trade off in uh, between that, uh, but, uh, previ uh, but, but the, the awareness had been increasing uh, um, recently. And um, I, I think that a lot of uh, strategy, a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, plan had been uh, installed and had been developed to to deal with the the, the deep, uh, that 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 you use the word uh, dilemma that we are uh, facing that, uh, like um, the carbon pricing is an example of how to to balance now in those thing but I think that what I, I believe that in the very near future that will be you know not not a not a big problem and it's not going not to be a dilemma that you use anymore. I, I just want to say that maybe it's even easier to convince uh, those in the mar those in the margins, uh, the marginal groups, uh, the importance of investing, because uh, when a typhoon, a disastrous one, uh, hits the country, they're the most affected and they have the least resources to survive that the disaster. It's even more difficult to convince uh, that uh, or to say that to um, a congressman who's thinking of uh, <laughs> of uh, you know the relationship that they have to maintain with the business groups currently invested in fossil-based uh, power plants. So, uh, so in the end, you know, you have to consider all this and. And uh, and you you should not you should not pit development against uh, environment uh, competitiveness against uh, yeah Me. and <laughs> those things <laughs> so yeah so but so but but uh, as I said um, more and more the poor are are the, this consciousness on environment is becoming uh, some, is something that the poor people in the Philippines uh, are, are, are beginning to uh, take in or imbibe because they suffer the most and they get very little help from the government once their livelihood, their houses are, are destroyed by climate. Thank you. Um. Dr. Chu, would you like to comment something? Before that, I really want to um, recognize that I'm really interested in one of your, um, when you mentioned, and this quite linked to your comment as well, when you, uh, in your model, you also measure the pollution per, un um, per unit of GDP as well, which, um, which is a very uh, interesting thing that uh, had been, been done because a lot of Southeast Asian countries are, or cities are actually um, one of among, sadly, among the most polluted cities 
cities globally and suffer quite a lot on uh, from from this. Um, yeah, would you like to comment? Yeah, sure. I'll comment on this question together. So basically, right, um, from what we feel, there's no so-called um, dichotomy, in fact, between economic growth and sustainability. In fact, there's a lot of opportunities that's being available because with green finance coming into play, for example, we're trying to have training of climate to track scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. So it's all opportunities. And we have countries, for example, like Laos, for example, exporting this power to work as the ASEAN, for example. There's a lot of opportunities available. But the challenging part is this transition that's being involved. How do we transit okay, without hurting those that is more vulnerable to our society? Because some of the, whenever there's change, there's always going to be winners and losers. So how can we help the losers to transit to better equilibrium than before? I feel this is a key challenge that we have. So in a green economy, I, I, I do foresee a win-win situation whereby the economy is striving even better than before and also an economy that is green and we can sustainable for our future generations. So, but it's, it's a transition that we are in today that makes it very difficult to help these winners and losers. And now to add on to the point of how do we measure and quantify this so-called cost per GDP, for example. So, so because this, if you use more renewable energy, they will increase the capacity, the potential. And in this sense over here, we are able to measure our economic growth to grow. And because of these opportunities available to this growth, they can go hand in hand in a sense. So the cost per GDP in our simulations that we simulated, which I'm happy to discuss, um, as later sitting as well, is that as long as the cost goes down in a way, in a way, it's a women's situation for everyone. So I think this is something we should work towards, and I think we can work towards it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think um, the answers and the questions and the comment by um, one of the participants over there, it's, uh, I think it's nicely um, conclude our session today. Um, um, I would like to uh, thank you all the panelists for your speech, but also a very interactive session. And thank you all the participants for your very insightful, interesting questions and comments. And um, thank you very much. I would like to remind you that the next session is in GC1 and there is a plen plenary session that will start at 4.30. And please kindly enter the hall through the side doors. Thank you very much and um, thank you everyone.